the Oscar-nominated short documentary, Island in Between, puts a focus on Taiwan and China in a time of tension. I speak with the director, S. Leo Cha. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. S. Leo Chong grew up in Taiwan and moved to the United States as a teenager. He eventually became a documentary filmmaker, largely based in the U.S., exploring a wide range of stories. His film subjects include a Hawaiian ukulele master, an Asian-American congressman, and Vietnamese immigrants in New Orleans. Leo was a producer on the PBS series Asian Americans and directed the 2019 film Our Time Machine about a Chinese artist who creates a life-size puppet trying to connect with his father in the process. Leo is a co-founder of the Asian American documentary network known as ADOC. His latest documentary is the short Island in Between, streaming from New York Times OpDocs. The film is produced by Gene Shen, who I interviewed on episode 130. Island in Between recounts Leo's personal journey to Taiwan's island of Kinmen. It's nestled just a few miles off the coast of mainland China. Military tension has hung over this border territory for 75 years, ever since the Communist Party took power in China and their opposition moved to Taiwan in a mass migration. In the film, Leo explains how this political climate was the backdrop to his childhood. I sang this song all the time as a kid. We were taught that we Taiwanese were Chinese in exile. And one day, with help from the U.S., we would retake China, freeing the mainland from the evil communists. And Kinmen would be the launching pad. In the early 2000s, relations between the two countries improved so that a ferry service was established between Kinmen and mainland China. Residents on both sides began to interact more. But at the start of COVID, the ferry service was suspended, and tensions are now on the rise again. If fighting broke out, how would the U.S. react? That remains a fraught question. But Leo's film isn't a didactic analysis. Instead, it's an effort to explore this place sitting at the crossroads of history. Leo is currently based in Taiwan. I reached him a few days ago by Zoom when he was visiting Los Angeles to attend an Oscar nominees event. I started by asking him how he first came to the United States. I came to the U.S. at age 15. Uh, I actually uh, came to the U.S. without my parents. I came with my younger siblings to live with my uncle and my aunt just to go to school for education. So it's actually related to the whole geopolitical situation. I mean, at that time, uh, the families with means, they are always looking for ways to have another escape patch, basically, uh, especially for their next generation. And I mean, part of it is also because, you know, U.S. and Taiwan always have this really twisted relationship where I'm like, I mean, honestly, I really consider, you know, Taiwan, uh, a colony of U.S. of sorts, right? And then there's this, that relationship of being the colonial subject with admire the, the, the colonial master would, you know, greatly. So so our offsprings are sent to the U.S. thinking that that's actually kind of the end all be all in terms of the, the education, so. You're getting educated in the U.S. What set you on a path to filmmaking? Uh, that's not normally the goal for an immigrant uh, family to send their kid into filmmaking. <laughs> um, you, you, you have it absolutely correct there. Uh, I, had, I have always been a cinephile. Um, so growing up, I actually grew up in a, a small uh, village, you know, in the countryside in southern Taiwan. And, you know, it's one of these things where my father's family and my mother's family lived on the same street. So I was always around all these aunts and uncles. And my aunts love these 
70s Taiwanese melodrama starring Richard Lin, uh, who ended up to be this, you know, Hong Kong movie star later on. But I just re remember growing up every week, we'll go see movies. And then my uncles would go take me to see Jackie Chan movies. And my aunts would take me to see these, you know, sort of um, like not in like the 50s uh, American, you know, uh, melodramas. Um, so I, I love, love, love movies. But as you said yourself, you know, um, being an immigrant family, my parents didn't exactly encourage me to pursue the arts. Uh, so even though I really loved it, I was considering it. I was also good at math and sciences. Um, so I actually ended up becoming an engineer. Um, I, I studied electrical engineer. I ed ended up uh, working at Apple computers for a couple of years. Uh, but I was always, uh, you know, sort of not letting go of the film part. I would volunteer at film festivals. I would intern for filmmakers. And it's actually a, a filmmaker I happened to be interning with in San Francisco who said to me one day, hey, the USC Film School application is due next month and here's a letter of recommendation and you have to apply to it. And, you know, I thought, hey, you know, why not? What harm would it do? I would never get in. I'm, I don't have a single sort of background in any kind of the fine arts or anything at all. And I got in. So I, I felt like somebody was telling me something um, and uh, off I went. So you earned a love of film from melodramas. What uh, steered you into documentary film? I, I, I think a lot of it has to do with my impatience of the development process for fiction films. I was also kind of a tortured scriptwriter. I don't think I was a terrible scriptwriter, but it was such a miserable experience sitting in front of the computer, super critical, everything I write, you know, if, if I'm lucky to write like, you know, a few lines of dialogue for, for a whole half day. I, anyway, it was not what I enjoy. And I love traveling and, and I was always, you know, uh, seeking these gigs that takes me all these strange places. And um, it, it just felt natural that documentary would be the direction that I would go. So over the past few decades, you've worked on uh, lots of different uh, projects, your own projects, working for, uh, as a crew member on other people's projects. Um, when you look back on those years, can you pick a project that you worked on that um, feels like it exemplifies, you know, the fullest expression of yourself? Well, you see, that's tricky, right? Because I feel like every new film is like, there's new revelations about what, what I could or could not do or should or should not have done for the previous film. Um, I mean, I, I would say that, that the, the one, you know, you're not supposed to pick your favorite child, but I think that the one that, <laughs> the one that is closest to my heart is definitely our time machine. Um, you know, which is a film I finished in 2018 and, and you know, went out to the festivals in 2019. Um, I, I just felt like um, the, the, uh, this, the emotional connection and, and the character development of that film was what I wanted to achieve in all, any, you know, in all my films. But that one, I felt like I got the closest to uh, achieving what I wanted to do. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, so, so the film is about, uh, two artists who happen to be father and son in Shanghai, China, um, a father who's in his eighties, um, is suffering from Alzheimer's. So the son decided to do this full scale, uh, human sized mechanical puppet show, uh, uh, you know, in hoping to collaborate with his father um, on it. But it, it ended up being an exploration of, of sort of mortality and time and memory. And um, yeah, and also sort of a celebration of, of art making, you know, and I think that uh, so many of those things are, are close to my heart. Um, so I'm, 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 you know, super, super proud of that and super proud of how we got to where we got to. Uh, yeah, how we got to where we were. Well, our time machine also is a it's a film based in China. You were collaborating with a, a Chinese co-director uh, on it. It comes at a time of kind of more opening up in China when um, when 
people, whether you were coming from the U.S. or Taiwan, or the, 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 there, there were these was a period of new possibilities, uh, uh, it felt like. And I, I wonder what that meant to you. I, you know, you grew up in Taiwan with a certain kind of mythology or demonology of China. Uh, you come to the U.S., you know, get indoctrinated in a uh, in a different culture um, that you can accept or reject. And what did it mean for you to finally go to China? And 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 when did you make your first trip? I, th I actually was trying to figure that I really should should do a little research and, and get a confirmation. I believe the first trip I made to China was in 2005 or 2006. I had attempted to move back to Taiwan the first time in 2005. You know, I, I lived in the U.S. for, you know, a long, long time by then, a good 15, 15 plus years. And uh, I just couldn't get traction that time. I feel like, you know, sort of being being in this mixed background, I, I you know, the sense of belonging is always a big challenge, right? So anyway, I, I tried to go back to Taiwan, didn't work. I ended up taking a job in the, uh, in uh, Singapore, uh, working for this production company that produced um, factuals, basically, like travel shows, you know, these kind of half hour TV stuff. And, and one of my f uh, projects was to do this uh, travel show, like a hosted travel show in China. So off I went, you know, up and down the coast, researching and then shooting. So that was my first trip to China. And, and it was kind of amazing because, you know, y y there was this sort of demonizing of China in my childhood, but we also study a lot of the history and the geography. So I was sort of, I mean, way more familiar than I should for somebody who really had nothing to do with China, you know, on, on the surface, right? And of course, this, the whole complicated national history and the entanglement. Um, so um, it was very exciting. You know, as you said, I think starting from 2000, maybe 2005 and onwards um, for about 10 years, there was this mo moment of, of real excitement. It feels like the uh, the country is finally opening up. China is finally opening up. Um, there's a lot of really incredible art that's being made. Um, you know, wonderful creative storytelling and so rich in terms of the subject matters that people are exploring. So foreign to most people. And as a documentarian, it was like you know a gold mine. Um, so so um, and 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 as somebody who is interested in, in visiting new places and, and, you know, getting to know people that I had no other opportunities to do. It felt like a natural place to, to be because I do know the, the language and I do connect on, in terms of the, the culture, culture and, and, and the history. Um, so, yeah, so I, I did stuff like that. I actually ended up uh, one summer, I uh, led a, um, a group of USC, you know, University of Southern California film students, which is where I went to film school uh, and, and taught in, in Beijing for a while. Um, I did uh, like a series of short artist portraitures for a, a executive producer in Hong Kong. And then I ended up making our time machine, but things were getting harder especially in the mid to uh, 2010s, I guess, you know, after like 2015, 2016, 2017, you could feel things changing. And, 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 you know, compared to now, you know, in terms of like now versus 10 years ago, it's a totally different world there. And, and as you know, you know, with, with all the, the uh, friends and colleagues that, that you have, you know, in the Chinese documentary circle, a lot of folks are, leaving or you know i mean i I'm, I'm i probably even shouldn't be saying this but i'm finishing a film where like i had to take my name off and the director has to take his name off um because it's deemed too sensitive and nobody knows where the the line is um that we can or cannot cross um yeah so it's uh it's been sort of a a a distressing arc that, that we're in the middle of and hopefully not. Yeah, it's, it seemed maybe 10 years ago, it seemed kind of hopeful. And uh, and then that uh, hope has really uh, closed up uh, recently. I mean, the phenomenon I, I encounter increasingly, and I'm sure you get even more of this, is teaching in New York. I have a lot of students from China uh, over the uh, past decade. And the 
conundrum for many of them is, you know, should I stay in the U.S. and uh, where maybe I'm going to have more freedom to uh, to make documentary films, or do I go back to China, which is the you know place where the stories I really want to tell uh, exist? Yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure those folks are are able to tell the stories that they want to tell anymore. Um, you know, now now that right, like it's the the the, the joke. Uh, is a not so funny joke, right? It's always like, well, you have to just make shows about food and you know wh whatever that just have zero sensitivity to to anything. I mean, you cannot talk about feminism. You certainly cannot talk about the the history of of communism. You know, in in the last half a century. I mean, there's this like what what you know what what can you, what can you do besides. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I might be sounding a little too down on it, but it just it just sort of makes me sad and, and to see, especially see friends struggle and, and, you know, people kind of making life choices because they cannot pursue the life that they've had. And um, yeah. Before I get to talking about uh, Island in Between, I want to ask about your experience as a organizer in the Asian American uh, documentary community. You helped co-found ADOC, which you know today is a is an important community can you take me back to to your early days when things weren't as organized and um and you know what it meant to be uh an an asian documentary maker in the u.s um yeah uh well i i, I think um I, I do think that it, it took me a while to figure out the path that I was going to be on. You know, I, I finished film school in 2000 and, uh, and I started making films and, and sort of pitching around subject matters. Um, a lot of them definitely Asian American subject matters. Um, I was just getting a lot of feedback of like, oh, you know, that the, the terms are always like niche and regional and, you know, uh, you know, like how, how would, you know, how would Bob and Joe in, you know, Kansas, that, that type of stuff. And, and I didn't really understand what that all meant. You know, I just kind of took it as like, well, you know, my film's not good enough or my story's not good enough. Um, and maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe they weren't, I'm, I'm not sure, right? Like who knew, who knew what, what the reason was, but, but I also started to see a pattern of like, okay, what well, you have to, like, I see other sort of quirky, um, you know, oddball ideas that did not involve, uh, uh, you know, Asian Americans being, being made and, and being shown. So I don't know, I started to wonder about that a little bit more. Um, you know, at that time there weren't also, um, I mean, it, it, uh, CAM, Center for Asian American Media in San Francisco, has done really great work over the years to um, really nurture and support documentary filmmakers. Um, but they they also had a priority of present representation instead of filmmaker cultivation. I mean, again, not that they didn't do it, but the priority was like, let's put Asian American images on screen, doesn't matter who makes it, right? Um, so, and then also for those of us who do some work in the U.S. and then some work elsewhere. When we do work in Asia or elsewhere, then we're necessarily supported um, by by an organization like CAM. So so there was quite a bit of frustration. I mean, there were a couple of role models that, that we had and all looked up to and have been very supportive. Um, people like Arthur Dong uh, and Rene Tajima Pena and then, you know, Frida Lee Mark. These, these are the people that, that we kind of looked up to. Um, but uh, they, they weren't necessarily any kind of a, a structural space um, for, for us. And, 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 you know, Grace Lee, who is my partner in crime in, in ADOG, we always tell the story. We basically went to uh, film schools in L.A. at the same time. She was at UCLA. Uh, I was at USC. Our, our thesis film show in the same festivals, in the same programs all the time. But we just did not say more than three words to each other. We just had never had an opportunity to connect until much later in, in like, I think 20, 
2014 or 2015, we were at Sundance, uh, Laura Gabber, you know, a filmmaker who's a great friend of both of ours who made City of Gold was premiering her film there. And we just happened to be set next to each other at her dinner. And we started talking We're like, why don't we know each other? Why wasn't there any space for us to build relationships and to connect? Um, you know, and, and that's kind of where ADOC was born. We, we just believe that even just the simple act of, of making a space so people can be together um, is, can o- already make a lot of magic. I mean, you know, this, this field is full of really smart, passionate people. And if they have the opportunity to connect, to get to know each other, there'll be collaborations and they'll do really interesting things. And uh, so that's how, that's why we started ADOC in, in 2016. And, and we hope that that's what we've been doing, you know, either publicly or behind the scenes to try and connect folks, to try and make space where folks can uh, feel comfortable, um, you know, sharing uh, both their professional and, and, and personal parts of their lives and, and build relationships that will last for, for decades, you know, like the ones that, that, you know, both Grace and I have, made in our own professional lives. So in that cohort, someone that you've collaborated with uh, in the past and uh, and on this uh, current film island in between is Jean Shen. Um, can you d- describe what your connection to Jean is and, and what that's meant to you? I, I remember, it's so funny, Jean, Jean was on the board of CAM, of Center for Asian American Media, and I remember at one event, maybe like, I don't know, 10 years ago, no, more than that now, a little bit more than maybe 12 years ago, she came up to me, she's like, oh, I heard of you, and I'm like, who, who is this lady, I don't know you, <laughs> um, you know, why are you so friendly to me, and then I later found out, who, you know, who she was, and her, her background, and I was like, oh, okay, and then, you know, the, so the relationship went from there, and it was so obvious that we were going to be really good friends, I mean, I don't, there, there are other Taiwanese American filmmakers, you know, I, I, that, that actually, it's so funny, because I, one of my um, realization is like I, I, that um, Taiwanese American as an identity is almost like a a new people are coming out of closet. You know, people are for for a long time saying, "Well, we're Chinese American," and myself included, because that's how we were taught, right? Um, but but in the last you know five years or so, a lot of friends that I've known for years and years and years, I'm realizing, that, oh, your mother is from Taiwan. You know, like somebody like Stephanie Wong Braille, like. Stephanie's Taiwanese American. She's not Chinese American from China. I mean, yes, the family originally came from China, but the parents' last stop was in Taiwan, so she she has connection there. Um, anyway, but the 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 two immigrant Taiwanese filmmakers in the U.S. that that is really Jean and I. Um, I mean, you know, and 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 it just from that simple fact we we just have this incredible shorthand and connection we 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 joke at the same jokes we have the same cultural references that a lot of people just don't have um we're not not outside of taiwan anyway um and and we you know we had similar background where we came uh sort of we're kind of 1.5 generation you know which is a term that means you you came as a child like as a teenager with of awareness and and, and a full life already in the home country. And, but now we're also fully immersed in, in the U.S. and, and cons- do consider ourselves Americans. And we, we really do consider, consider ourselves both Taiwanese and American, and I guess and Taiwanese American, right? Um, so that's a really long-winded way of saying that, that you know, she, she does feel like a sister to me. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of chat on the phone constantly all the time both serious stuff and just gossip. And sometimes we talk about politics in Taiwan. Sometimes we talk about her family, my family, you know, and then sometimes we obviously talk about work. Um, so uh, it, I feel really lucky to have her. And I know I'm not the only person that feels that way. Um, and, and you know, uh, she's been, you know, initially just supported from the sidelines. And then, you know, with our time machine, she got involved, and then she was the also the EP of Asian Americans, um, the PBS series that I was very glad to to be a part of. And then now um, with Island Island in Between, you know, she's um, fully on board as the the producer. Before COVID uh, hit, you had just made our time machine. You'd been doing more work uh, in China, and 
and you were in Taiwan and and maybe not expecting to stay in Taiwan for uh, such a long time, except COVID kind of uh, froze everything. Am I, am I right in that perception? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a little bit of prelude to that, which is that we actually, my partner and I officially moved to Taiwan. We, we rented our house, our apartment in San Francisco in 2017 because we were Trump refugees. <laughs> we were like, you know what? That's Let's try something else. And and Taiwan was the, the most logical place for us to be because it was an easy entry. And I also, you know, I have been working in Asia, you know, because of Time Machine and other, you know, jobs. And he, you know, who he's a theatrical set designer and he had also been working in China, in Japan. Um, so it felt like the natural place to be. Except that um, the second I land in, in Taiwan, I get offer Asian Americans. So I basically lived in LA from uh, late 2018 through just like January, 2020. Um, you know, at which point, you know, my, my, my partner Dan and I were like, okay, well, let's go back to Taiwan. My gig is done, you know? And everybody says, uh, have you heard about, you know, that COVID thing is so dangerous, you shouldn't go, you know, Asia sounds incredibly, especially Taiwan, so, you know, so connected to China, and it turned out to be the safest place on earth. I mean, Taiwan did an incredible job uh, managing the pandemic, um, which is one of the reasons why people even, um, you know, have sort of become more familiar about Taiwan in the last couple of years, uh, that, was, that being kind of a threat that was always in the news. So what did it mean for you to be really living, living in uh, Taiwan after several decades of, of, of not being rooted in this place that's part of your identity? I think that before this latest stretch, um, my my relationship with Taiwan was a little stunted, if you will. You know, it kind of remained this teenage relationship of, of somebody, you know, uh, who connected to this this place as a 15-year-old. I mean, that was as far as I got, um, both in my understanding, you know, and in my relationship. Sure, I, I, I would go, you know, every year and sometimes I stay several weeks, but it, you know, I was always looking at it, um, you know, at, at an arm's length and, and people were looking at me uh, very much like, well, you're American, right? Um, you know, you, you talk funny, you don't understand the cultural references in the last 20 years or so. Um, but this time, because of, of, of this, um, I mean, it, in, in so many ways, it was this silver lining in um, of the pandemic for me, the fact that I was able to really f reconnect with Taiwan, with the place, you know, I, I, I it, it's, it's I, I don't even know how to really describe this evolve um, relationship I have with the place. It, it feels different to walk on the street. It feels different to, you know, to breathe the air and to, to see, you know, whatever it is that I see around around me. My relationship with my parents certainly have changed a lot. I might said in, in Ireland in between that I, I spent more time with my parents during those pandemic years than, than I had, you know, since I left um, Taiwan more than 30 years ago. Um, you know, so all those felt like such gifts. Um, it also really made me reorient and reprioritize my work life. Um, I, I really do feel like that's where I'm supposed to be and I'm supposed to be investing myself into telling more Taiwanese stories. And, and I, I'm in this position of being able to translate um, these stories. I mean, Taiwanese history is hugely complicated and it's one of the reasons why people don't understand it because once you start to explain, people just get confused so <laughs> yeah i mean it's you know i mean the official name of taiwan which not many people know about is actually republic of china um that's that's you know what's on my passport and people are like what are you we, i thought you guys were not part of china and now you're saying you're part of china you know and then you go into this explanation of the civil war and and you know of u.s involvement you know united nations and all that and people are like that's <laughs> that's enough anyway um uh, that's a long winded way of saying that that I feel like I am in this unique position of being able to translate this really complex situation um, for an audience internationally who I'm more familiar with than most of the, the storytellers uh, in Taiwan. So it feels like that's the good use of my time right now. 
So Kinman Island, the subject of an island in between, what did this place mean to you? You know, I, I think that I'm getting this question a lot. I think people assume that I have a, a really strong connection to the island. I actually, I don't have that strong connection to it any more than a lot of the, most of the Taiwanese people, you know. Uh, so that being that, um, you know, we heard about this place all of our lives. It's this mythical place out in the middle of water somewhere really close to China. I didn't realize how close until I got there. Um, and in, in my case, and it actually also, you know, I think Gene's uncle as well. So my father served in uh, uh, for his mandatory military service um, in the Kimmen Islands. Um, and so he would tell me these stories. And Gene's uh, uncle also did the same thing. You know, he also served there. Um, and, and um, you know, the stories that they bring back from serving in the military there are are um scary stories they're they're not they're not um you know uh fun stories about how beautiful the place is how great the food is is about how uh their lives are miserable and they're afraid that the the mainland soldiers or or you know navy's gonna like swim across the 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 strait and and cut off their ears or their heads in the middle of the night i mean that kind of stuff um so uh, I, f in 2020, actually, um, I decided to go with my parents and part of it was because when you leave Taiwan at that time, um, it, you needed to do two weeks of mandatory quarantine after you return. And the government is really strict. Like you have to be in the hotel room. You came and, you know, um, stay with, uh, the, the person that you're traveling with. You have to stay in like in basically individual cells. It felt like a prison. So uh, the domestic tourism was booming and we decided that, you know, why don't we go to uh, Kimmen because, you know, dad served there and he's not been back for a long time. And I was really curious. So that's how I even ended up there to start with. Um, and, and, and what I saw was so different from, from what I had heard about, you know, at least in my imagination, the place did not look like that or feel like that. Uh, and the people did not act like that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I, I came back to Taipei and, and, and you know, I um, was working with Cenex, um, the, the foundation and production company in Taipei that had been organizing the, the big um, the doc documentary pitching forum in Taipei every year that I've been involved with as a, as a trainer. Um, and the, the CEO of Cenex, Ben, had also just gone to Kinmen, you know, on a separate trip, and he was really intrigued by it. So, so as we were talking, we decided that, well, this should be, you know, this should be one of the projects that we work on together. And, and Ben, you know, at, at the time was also um, really enthusiastic about a new initiative that he was putting together called Taiwan Matters. I mean, he, he was going around raising all this money from the tech sector in Taiwan, which is a big, big community, very wealthy. Um, and, and he had raised a bunch of money and wanted to tell like a slate of Taiwanese stories again for international audience. And I have been working with him to develop some of those ideas as well. So, so it all felt like serendipity um, that, that, you know, it was the right time to tell this story. Um, and I felt like I was the right person to tell this story. In the film, it feels to me like there's an effort to engage people without putting a political filter on them. So I'm thinking of a scene with two women who are talking, they're describing they haven't seen their families in three years because the ferry rides have stopped between... Uh, Kinmen Island and uh, and China and as I'm watching that scene, I my brain immediately is trying to process: well, Are they Chinese? Are they Taiwanese? And then I think the film is kind of teaching me to pull back, to withdraw that question, and say, "Well, it doesn't matter. They're just you know they're they're people who are kind of caught up in some of the uh, geopolitics here that they didn't choose, uh, but." Um, you know, affects their personal relationships when they can see their family or, or, or not see their family. I mean, I wonder if you can, you know, reflect on that of, of trying to separate human beings from the, the, the politics that enmesh them. 
And I, I think I'm not the only person who is fascinated by, by stories on the border. Um, you know, I, I think that that's often the most interesting place, places. They, they're most interesting places to, to see the world, right? I mean, I think more and more, especially, you know, in, in feels like anyway, maybe it's always been this way, but in the last few years, more and more, um, like the, the people are becoming more and more tribal. People are, are, are being forced to choose sides all the time, you know, from the micro, you know, even within the documentary community, that's, that's you know, face it, it's been super div- divisive. Some of the things that has happened over the last few years, that kind of breaks my heart. Um, and then, you know, in a much, much bigger scale to all the conflicts in the world right now, right? It's like, it's either, either you're with us or you're with them. And if you're with, with them, then you're our enemy. And, and I mean, I, I, I loathe and, 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 and I want to challenge and push back to that simplistic way of seeing the world. And then really that's the fundamental motivation, you know, for, for, for me telling uh, island in the be- between the way that I did, you know, I, I really want to get beyond this um, geopolitical, um, you know, like war games, chess games of government A did this to government B. So in response, government B did like so. What what like what happened to these people that are you know maybe have connections to both government A and government B? Like what what are their lives like? You know, how can we relate to them? You know the. The, the what I've been told by the people outside is that no, you cannot because they're they're the devil and they're scary and they, they do terrible things. But no, that's that's not the case. That's not the case. Um, you know, people can feel connections to both sides and 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 still, um, you know, like if, if as a Taiwanese person, I could love the the my Chinese friends and love you know the Chinese stories. But still support the the democratic system, you know, uh, proudly that we have in Taiwan, um, and 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 just because a, a Chinese filmmaker, you know, is supportive of Taiwan and is critical of certain policies, doesn't mean that they don't love their country, and and you know. So anyway, I, I think that that you know the the scene you're talking about in in island in between between the two, they're they're mainland um, ladies who have married in, to Kinmen. Um, you know, even though they obviously still, you know, very feel very connected to to their um, families in China, they're raising Taiwanese families. They have kids who grew up in in Kinmen who are Taiwanese citizens. You know, I mean that the, even even though though this is sort of what happens on this very small island, this is you know the same scenario. Every I mean the U.S. right like that's there's there's still plen- there's certainly plenty of, of of you know people coming from backgrounds that maybe. U.S. would consider, you know, sort of uh, uh, opposition or enemy, but but who are very much, you know, living in that same in betweenness that these folks in in Kinmen is living. So, um, I, I'm not sure if that's the question you were asking, but but that's you know, like I think like that feels like, um, you know, the the goal was to not speak on behalf or or to not. Um, you know, sort of make these imperial statements, em, empirical, empirical statements. I see this is my bad English is still haunts me after, you know, um, make these empirical statements about, uh, uh, you know, the, the political situation. It's to make sure that everything in the film is filtered through um, either the personal point of view of the people who appears in the film or my own point of view, like a, a, the entire uh, narration, you know, it's about how I feel, what my family experience, you know, my fears and my hopes. Um, and I feel like that's, you know, to take the, the hard political angle out of it will make it more resonance, uh, make it more resonant for a, a larger number of people, which is ultimately the goal. You know, I want folks outside of the region. I want folks who might not be familiar with Taiwan, um, to get it, to understand a little bit more. I mean, it's not, you know, it's a, just a little slice of, of life, right? It's a one um, glim- glimpse into the situation, but I'm hoping that people will become more curious and want to find out more. I want to thank S. Leo Chan for speaking with me. His short film, 
Island in Between, streaming on New York Times Op Docs and nominated for this year's Oscars. His recent feature documentary, Our Time Machine, is available for rent on Amazon and other platforms. See our show notes for links. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan in Helsinki, Finland, and marketing manager Bella Racklin in Los Angeles, California. I'm Tom Powers in Montclair, New Jersey. Our music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael and Nehausen. You can follow us on Instagram at Pure Nonfiction and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. <laughs>